Welcome. Mm -hmm. um, over the next three weeks, we're going to look at the, a very, in terms of words, a very small part of the gospel. Um, the story of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, according to Matthew. Each year during Holy Week, the church puts before us two opportunities in which the passion is proclaimed. On Palm Sunday, each year, the Passion is read, either the Passion of Matthew, Mark, or Luke, on a three-year cycle. And then on Good Friday, always the Passion of John is proclaimed. Now, before the Vatican Council, all four of those Passions were proclaimed during Holy Week. For instance, on Sunday, there was always Matthew, and then on Tuesday and Wednesday were Mark and Luke, and then on Friday was John. So at that point, all four of those passions were, were read. And the point being that we get a chance every year to hear the differences that are present within two recordings, within two, two statements of the same, of the same event. Um, For the earliest generations of the church, the good news, the gospel, really was the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that, that proclamation. And presumably that was the first part written was the reflections upon that event. And that only after that were written filling out what happened previously in his public life. And then only in Matthew and Luke is there any attempt to describe in any way his infancy, his birth and infancy. This fellow by the name of Dodd, C.H. Dodd, British gentleman, says that um, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are really the story of the passion of Jesus with a very long introduction. <laughs> At the heart of it is the passion of Jesus. Okay. Um, people began reflecting on the life of Jesus, his public life, only sometime after his death and sometime after the proclamation of the good news, which occurred originally in Jerusalem. And they started remembering and telling stories about what they had experienced. And the same thing was true of the story of the passion and death of Jesus. So we find differences in the stories, and we find popular devotions that have grown up about those events that are different from what we find in the scriptures. And just as an example, we all know the Stations of the Cross. The presumption is that there are 14 Stations of the Cross. And yet, at various times in the life of the church, there have been various numbers. Less than 14, more than 14, 16, 20, 22, 9, 8. There have been a variety of ways in which snapshots were given of the passion of Jesus. But the, the ones we have now, the 14, a fair number of those stations of the cross are not mentioned in the scriptures. The story of Veronica is not found in the scriptures. The story of Jesus meeting his mother is not found in the scriptures. The story of Jesus falling three times is not found in the scriptures. And yet, for centuries it has been part of the prayer life of the church, the meditation of the church, the reflection of the church, and what it would indicate was that there was popular devotion that occurred. And those popular devotions, in a sense, became very, very romantic in, in the sense of, of there being an emotional tie to them, uh, an emotional connection to them. So there is an emotional connection to the story of Veronica who braves the crowd and wipes the sweat and blood off Jesus' face. That's a, there's, a, there's an emotional tie in that. Or Jesus falling stumbling and falling and having to struggle 
uh, to get up. Now, the, the first reference we have to the Stations of the Cross as being a devotion comes from uh, late 4th, early 5th century. And it comes from a travel log. There was this fairly wealthy woman named Agaria who lived in what you and I would now know as southern France. And she went to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage and she happened to be there on, uh, on Holy Week. And she observed a tradition that was living in Jerusalem where there would be a procession through the old city on Good Friday and the procession would stop and there would be songs sung and prayers prayed as they made the way from what began at Pilate's um, place of condemnation outside beyond the wall where the crucifixion would have taken place. And so these people would make this procession. And she was taken by it. She just was thought was very enthusiastic about it. And it was one of the things she wrote down, uh, her experience. And when she got back home, she, what people who go on trips often do, you call your neighbors in and you, you tell the story. <laughs> Uh, what was what went on, you know? And for her, uh, it wasn't showing the slides; it was, you know, acknowledging what she had seen. And as she told the story of what these people did on Good Friday, it was not uncommon that her neighbors would say, "Gee, wouldn't that be nice if we could do that?" I mean, none of us are are able to go to Jerusalem, but that sounds like a wonderful way to reflect upon and pray upon the death and resurrection of Jesus. And little by little, that, that tradition starts. And it starts in one small community after another small community. And, you know, decade after decade, it grows until by the time of the high Middle Ages, it's a, it's a standard devotion throughout the entire church. But it is built upon the experience of the local community, the faith of the local community. So what I'd suggest is that the Gospels themselves, the writing of the Passion according to Matthew, reflects the community in which that, that text was written. And they're going to emphasize in the story of the suffering and death and resurrection of Jesus, they're going to emphasize what they believe is important to them. And that may be a, vi a bit different than what was important to the, the community that Mark's text was about. Remember, Mark was written, was written early, was written probably around 60 uh, AD, between 60 and 70. Um, it was written for Roman Christians. Jews and Gentiles who had become Christians, but were living in Rome. It was written about the time of the Emperor Nero. Uh, Nero burns down the city and he blames the Christians for it. And the Christian persecution begins and it's out of that that Mark's Gospel arises. And Mark's Gospel, for instance, has all kinds of, of, um, of tension in it around uh, around individuals' belief and individuals' uh, acceptance um, of the faith. There's a, in Mark's Gospel, no one makes an act of faith in Jesus until the very end. There's none of the disciples, none of the, anybody, nobody makes an act of faith. Nobody says, you are the Son of God until the very end. And only at the very end of the story, it's the Roman centurion who says, Truly, you are the Son of God. So it, it's, it's, no, uh, it's, it's no Jew or, or Jewish convert that makes that, that statement. Also, there's a lot of suffering in Mark's Gospel in the sense of there's a lot of betrayal in Mark's Gospel. The place of Judas is very, very high in Mark's Gospel because people were betraying each other. Neighbors were pointing out who the Christians were. 
and the Christians were then being carted off. So you had a society in which, in which people were squealing on each other. And consequently, there was a huge amount of, of distrust that was present among, among members of the household of the faith. So, and it's out of that context then that the gospel is written. And so what are they going to do? They're going to point out the many ways in which Jesus is abandoned, the many ways in which Jesus is rejected, the many ways in which Jesus finds no support. And that's, that's much more pop, er, present in Mark than it is in Matthew, Luke, or John. Well, what we're doing is we're looking at Matthew's, at Matthew's passion. Um, Matthew's Gospel opens up with Herod the king and the chief priests and the scribes plotting to kill the child Jesus. That's the part of the opening story. Matthew's Gospel comes to an end with Pilate, the chief priests, and the scribes all instrumental in putting Jesus to death. So the story begins with the plot to murder, and the story ends with the plot to murder. In the infancy narrative, there are five, if you will, five sections. There's the work of Herod, and the chief priests and the scribes, there's the work of Mary and Joseph. There's the work of the Magi. And then there's the work of God, the work of the angel. Now at the end of the story, there is also a five-fold pattern, this time of friends of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea, Mary Magdalene, the women at the cross, the disciples, and then the enemies of Jesus, the chief priests, the Pharisees, and the guards. So there are players that very much, if you will, uh, mirror each other, that are part of the beginning story and part of the ending story. The disciples of, of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel clearly profess that, that Jesus is the Son of God. For instance, in the 14th chapter of Matthew, they're in the boat. There's the great storm. Uh, Jesus calms the waves. And they say, truly, you are the Son of God. In the 16th chapter, Jesus asks, who do people say I am? Peter speaks up, you are the Son of the living God. And in spite of the fact that they were that they made that affirmation during Jesus' public life, it seems, it seems all the more difficult to grasp why they refused to fight for him in the agony in Gethsemane, why it was that they ran away. And clearly they did. Clearly Jesus is left alone and in Matthew's Gospel, there is no one standing with him. Even at the cross in Matthew's Gospel, there is nobody beneath the cross. The women are at a distance and they're watching what happens. It's only in John's Gospel that the people are standing beneath the cross. So Jesus is left pretty much alone. Okay. We begin on chapter 26 of, um, of the Gospel according to Matthew. And it, from 26 to the end of the book is the story of the passion, death, and, and resurrection of Jesus. Matthew 26 starts just after the picture of the final judgment. I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. That's the final scene that Matthew records in the public life of Jesus. Then, 
Then we begin chapter 26. Jesus had now finished all he wanted to say, and he told his disciples, It will be the Passover, as you know, in two days, the time when the Son of Man will be, ho will be handed over to be crucified. So in Matthew, this event takes place in conjunction with Passover. There are two feasts that occurred prior to Jesus' time that were very much linked with each other. One was the Feast of Passover, which commemorated the release of the people from bondage in Egypt. The other was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was an agricultural feast, a spring agricultural feast. Both of them were pilgrimage feasts. Both of them would, 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 uh, would seek to have the pious Jew make a journey to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. But they were very close to each other and it became literally, well, very, very difficult for people to do both of them. And so what happened before Jesus' time was they were brought together. And so the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of the Passover were celebrated at the same time and they became interchangeable words for each other. So when people said, um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they could well have meant the Passover. We're told then that the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest whose name was Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the leading figure of Judaism at the time. He was high priest from 18 AD to 36 AD. He succeeded his father, Annas. His father, Annas, is mentioned in the story as well, his father-in-law. Um, Luke says, and Acts say that Annas, his father-in-law, played a major role in the functioning of the high priesthood of Caiaphas. So they were, in a sense, a, a team, Annas and Caiaphas. But they were, the, they were the deciding voice for Judaism. We find almost no reference to the scribes and Pharisees in the story of the passion and death of Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees are the story of northern Palestine, the area of Galilee. That's where the, the, the power, if you will, the legal power of the, of the scribes and Pharisees took place. Down in Jerusalem, it's the priesthood that has the power the priesthood of the temple that has the power. Then we're told in the sixth verse of that chapter, Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper when a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of the most expensive ointment and poured it on his head as he was at table. Now, Bethany is a, a little village, a tiny village that's about two miles outside of Jerusalem. It's easily a, a, a nice afternoon's walk between Jerusalem and, and Bethany. We're told here in Matthew's Gospel that, um, that during the time of, the, of Passover, that Jesus' place of lodging, where he stayed, uh, was in Bethany and not in the city. We're told that he was anointed by Simon the leper. He was in the home of Simon the leper. Presumably he was eating, it was at table. And we're told that he is anointed there. Now, in John's Gospel, he's anointed in the house of Zach, uh, of, uh, of Lazarus and, 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 uh, and, and Mary and uh, Martha. So in, it's a different venue in the two Gospels. What is used is an alabaster flask of ointment, of precious ointment. Alabaster is a transluent, uh, translucent gypsum that is carved in the shape of a flask and holds perfume. It has a long and narrow neck 
and very often the neck was snapped off to open it and then the perfume would be poured out. So it was, it was a, a sealed container. Then we're told that she poured it on his head. Commentators find in her action an allusion to the coronation ritual of the kings of ancient Israel. That the anointing of the king was the, if you will, the moment in which this person is raised to that stature. In John's Gospel, Jesus' feet are anointed, not his head. And in John's Gospel, it said he was anointed in preparation for his burial. Remember, the, the, Judas has a big problem with this and says this could have been sold for a lot of money and now it's wasted. And Jesus says, don't bother her, don't, don't worry her. What she has done, she has done in preparation for my burial. So that interpretation of, of this woman anointing Jesus on the head and the image of the, the coronation of a king, uh, for the early church, this would have posited that the, the, the anointing was a confession on the woman's part, a proclamation on the woman's part that Jesus was the Messiah. That for the people of Jesus' time, the kingdom would be restored by the Messiah. Remember when he comes into Jerusalem, they want to they pro proclaim as, um, him as king. They want to announce him as Messiah. When he changes the, the bread and the fish into food for the, the crowd, they come looking for him to make him king, to proclaim him as the Messiah. Okay, following the the, um, the time in the house of, of Simon the leper, we're told that one of the twelve, the man called Judas, this is verse 14, the man called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and says, what are you prepared to give me if I hand him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces, and from that moment on, he looked for an opportunity to betray Jesus. 30 pieces of silver is the exact amount of money which is the value of a slave. In the book of Exodus, in the 21st chapter, it is indicated that 30 pieces of silver is what you pay for a slave. Again, an image behind the story, an image of, of Jesus being being handed over as a slave might be handed over. Jesus being purchased um, as a slave might have been purchased. Then we're told in the 17th chap and the 17th verse of the first chapter that it was on the day of first day of unleavened bread. The first day refers to the daytime before the evening in which Passover started. Remember, days begin at sundown for the Jew. From sundown to sunrise, pardon me, from sundown to sundown is a day. You know, we do it from 12 to 12, from midnight to midnight. But they begin, which is not surprising, I mean, given the fact of there being no electricity, there being nothing to, to illuminate the evening so that when it gets dark, um, that's, that's both the end and the, the beginning. Um, so the sundown uh, is the time of, um, of the, the beginning of, of the, the day. So when it says on the first day, it refers to the daytime before the sun went down, before Passover began. So if Passover began on on uh, sundown on Wednesday night, then this would be late Wednesday morning, early Wednesday afternoon. Um, and the disciples are told to go into the city and to prepare, to prepare a place for Jesus to observe the Passover with, 
with his disciples. Now in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this meal that you and I know as the Last Supper is the Passover meal. In John, it is not. For John, the meal is the night before Passover. Because as John tells the story, it's at the moment of the slaying of the Passover lambs. On that afternoon before the sun goes down, that Jesus dies. And in John's Gospel, remember, they've got to hurry to get him buried real fast because, because the, uh, the special Sabbath was beginning. So he's, he's, being, uh, he's being crucified on the day prior to, um, to Passover. And that's very important in John's Gospel that the death of Jesus be linked up with the slaughter of the Paschal Lamb because in the sense of the very beginning of the story it's John the Baptist who points out Jesus to Andrew and another one of the disciples and says behold there goes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so the, the story of the public life begins with the image of the Lamb and in John the this, this story comes to completion with the, the death of Jesus at the time of the slaughter of the lamb. 